Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. I'm your host, Jason Aiken. In this week's episode, I'm going to be discussing a comic book that ties in with H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos, Weird Detective from Dark Horse Comics. Last year, Alan Moore and Jason Burroughs' Providence received a great deal of attention in the Lovecraftian community before it was even released. But I don't remember hearing too much about Weird Detective. I think it's a comic that kind of fell below everyone's radar last year, and I'm going to be discussing it in depth during this episode. Weird Detective ran in Dark Horse Presents, which is Dark Horse's staple comics anthology title. Weird Detective is branded as a Lovecraftian crime comic. The tagline is, It takes a monster to catch a monster. Weird Detective is written by Fred Van Lente and illustrated by Giu Villanova. Josen Gonzalez is the colorist, and Nate Pikos of Blambot is the letterer. Francesco Francavilla provided art for one of the covers to Dark Horse Presents number 8, featuring Sebastian Green, the main character, on the cover. I included that image as the image for the title card of this episode. In my experience, the way Dark Horse Presents usually works is that each strip in the anthology gets eight pages per issue. This is the case with Weird Detective as well. Eight pages multiplied by three installments comes out to 24 pages, which is the same page count for a normal comic book in today's market. Weird Detective ran in Dark Horse Presents number 8 through 10. The third part concluded by announcing Weird Detective will return in a new number one issue. More on that at the end of my review. But first, let's start by looking at the cover to Dark Horse Presents Volume 3, number 8. It's much more prominent in the interior pages, but you might notice the look of the main character, Detective Sebastian Green, is based on H.P. Lovecraft. The only difference is that Green has blonde hair, and Green's Canadian. If the main cover doesn't do it for you, definitely take a look at the interiors for better examples of the resemblance. This particular storyline is titled, Weird Detective, The Stars Are Wrong. Now, I'm going to be going over this story in detail. Um, There will be spoilers, but I don't think it's necessarily going to spoil anything. Because this story arc isn't really a complete story. It's more of a first issue that sets up the real storyline to come in the series. But, if you don't want to know any spoilers, um, feel free to stop listening now. Part 1 opens with a modified quote from H.P. Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu. Reading this provides some nice foreshadowing to where Van Lente is going with the story. Here is the original H.P. Lovecraft quote. And following it is the quote from Weird Detective. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. H.P. Lovecraft, The Call of Cthulhu. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the ability of the mind to correlate all its contents. Fred Van Lente, Weird Detective, The Stars Are Wrong. Weird Detective, The Stars Are Wrong, takes place on the island of Manhattan, New York City, in the present day. It begins with Detective Sebastian Green arriving at a community swimming pool in Red Hook. A body has been discovered at the bottom. I use the term body very loosely, pardon the pun, as only the skin of the victim is found. 
The crime isn't the only unusual thing going on in this book, though. Green is the narrator of the story, and he says some pretty strange things about his senses. According to Green, we, humans, only have three senses. Taste and smell. And those are just a subset of touch. He also mentions... Retina are literally extensions of our brains, and something about vibrations of air in the ear canals being fired across a specialized nerve. From these scientific observations, you definitely get the impression that this guy isn't a normal detective. We find out that Green works in the Minor Crimes Unit. From the sounds of things, all the weird cases that other squads don't want ruining their stats, these cases get dumped on minor crimes. According to their captain, Captain Long, or Lung, the brass considers them inconvenient crimes. The captain feels the body might have traveled into the pool through the water system. It's at the pool where Green meets his new partner, Detective Santa Fayez. Green is pretty cold to her and makes it known he doesn't want a partner. However, since he has 17 senses and not just three like us, he finds out what she's really up to. He uses a sense called Renekesh, the sense of emotional location, to use the ultraviolet spectrum to get inside her head. He finds out she's been given an assignment from the chief of detectives to investigate him. Apparently, up until a few months ago, Green was a hump. For 15 years, he was an unremarkable detective, with only an acceptable clearance rate. But he's become a super cop, seemingly overnight. It seems Fias spent most of her time in counterterrorism where she apparently blew the whistle on something or someone. The chief of detectives tells her the mayor doesn't let them retaliate against whistleblowers, but the chief hangs her pension over her head and forces her to investigate Green nonetheless. Green walks away from Fayez, with the captain telling her that she's going to see how unique Green's methods are. This first part got me interested, So far, calling the comic Lovecraftian, rather than Cthulhu Mythos, is an apt branding. At least for me. I find Green's outlook and abilities Lovecraftian. We haven't seen any references to the Mythos, save for the opening quote. There's definitely something up with Green, though. He's just not quite right. Part 2 opens with Fayez interrogating the pool's janitor in the boys' locker room. She's asking him the standard questions, but Green seems to be distracted by something. He's standing behind the janitor, looking up at the ceiling. He interrupts Fayez's interview, asking the janitor why there's a camera in the showers. At first, Fayez is upset for Green interrupting, but once the question sinks in, she's on board. The janitor panics and runs away. Fayez goes after him, but rather than chase him, Green makes use of another sense of his, Ranos. It's a reverse sonar that uses the heartbeat to allow him to see what's on the other side of an obstacle. In this case, it's the janitor running on the other side of the wall. Green manages to vibrate at just the right frequency so that he can reach through the wall, grab the janitor, and slam his head into it. Fayez finds him on the ground and arrests the janitor. She jokes about Green not needing a partner, but Green just smiles at her. The captain shows up and compliments Green on a job well done. They come to the conclusion that the janitor is not connected to the body, as the body most likely washed into the pool. Fayez invites Green to get something to eat and chit-chat, but he says he's not hungry. She tells him that she'll call him when the coroner gives his report. 
Green tells her not to worry about it, as he's already as he already knows the coroner isn't going to find a mark on the victim. He drives away, leaving Fayez in silence. Now, on the on a nearby telephone pole, there's a bunch of missing pet posters for lost dogs and cats. I'm fairly certain this is foreshadowing something. The scene then changes to Green's houseboat. He walks in and opens a refrigerator full of Diet Fizzo and chugs one down. His cat calls him a poser and reminds him that he needs fed. Green apologizes to the cat and feeds it. Green says that Diet Fizzo contains the only chemicals his body requires to function, particularly phosphoric acid and phenylalanine. The cat has a smart mouth on him and tells Green to tell it to someone who gives a shit. The cat also tells Green that the police will probably catch him soon. Green tells the cat that the police have already sent a hunter on his trail. He also tells the cat that his time is limited and only just today discovered the first lead on his mission here. The cat reminds him the deal is that Green keeps his tummy full and the cat will teach him how to become a predator on the island of Manhattan instead of prey. Green uses a sense called Mokadin, which is the ability to read minds through the eyes. He states it's basically vision backwards. According to Green, if you ever thought a pet or animal was trying to tell you something with its stare then you have an underdeveloped sense of Mokadin. Apparently, he uses this to communicate with the cat. This part ends with a shot into Green's bedroom, where another Sebastian Green is on a bed, surrounded by a plastic bubble, and medical machines appear to be pumping oxygen or something into it. So yeah, the guy walking around is definitely not the real Sebastian Green we've been following. This wasn't unexpected as he seemed to separate himself from the rest of the human race when talking about himself in the narration. Add that to his body only needing chemicals found in Diet Fizzo, his extra senses, and it all adds up. This was a great second chapter, I thought. I really liked how the interior of Green's houseboat had pulp magazine covers on the wall. I can make out that one issue is an issue of Argosy, but the logo isn't visible on the other one. There's an issue of Strange Detective that shows up on the wall in the next chapter, though. I also really liked how Green is able to talk to cats. That's very Lovecraftian, a la Randolph Carter and the dream quest of Unknown Kadath. Now, for part three, I found the opening to this chapter to be a bit jarring. The scene changes all of a sudden to a young man and woman. The woman's dad renovates apartments, and they sneak into one for a romantic evening. This is spoiled when the young man goes to take a dump and starts getting sucked down into the toilet by something. Basically, he's being sucked out of his skin, similar to the victim in the first part of this story. The young woman panics, and she runs outside. She looks behind her down the hallway, and seems to forget that she's not on the ground level. The young woman falls and slams her head off the scaffolding on the way down, before falling to the street. I don't think she's going to make it. I didn't really like this opening scene. There wasn't anything that noted this is where the weird detective strip started either. And I flipped to the end to make sure it was. And I ended up getting spoiled as a result. Due to the randomness of this scene, it almost makes me believe this weird detective story was originally a 24-page comic script that they chose to break up into three eight-page stories for Dark Horse Presents. The transition between parts one and two was fine, though, so that could just be me overthinking things. Part three does get better, though. We check back in on Green, 
or rather the thing pretending to be green, on the houseboat. He's watching film clips of famous detectives on his laptop. These include Sherlock Holmes, played by Basil Rathbone, Sam Spade, played by Humphrey Bogart, Jim Rockford, played by James Garner, and Lenny Briscoe, played by Jerry Orbach. He studies them to better blend in. Green then gets a call from Captain Lung. Another body has turned up in Red Hook. This is the body of the young woman from earlier in the chapter. Green leaves his houseboat, thinking how he's gone months without a single lead, when all of a sudden two occur in one day. He also states, Time constricts until the stars are right, and the horrors I have been sent here to stop awake and lead to the destruction of my world. Sebastian Green's body will serve me well in this regard. I hope he appreciates the experience of inhabiting mine. The last page shows three Yithians, with the one in the middle, Green, thinking, My name is Sebastian Green. I'm with the NYPD. Won't somebody help me? There it is, the Cthulhu Mythos Connection. I had expected the great race of Yith was playing a part in this, but the original body of Sebastian Green being preserved on his bed threw me off. I'm not sure how a third body comes into play here, because that you have number one, the Yithian, two, Sebastian Green, and three, the Sebastian Green that's walking around. Perhaps the Yithians had to construct a body better suited to deal with the threat that's eminent. I guess we'll find that out in the series. Overall, I thought this was a good starting point. I was hoping for a complete story in and of itself, but this is clearly meant to be a backdoor pilot of sorts for the Weird Detective series or miniseries. I think a miniseries is more likely, though, as that appears to be Dark Horse's business model at the time. I'd bet on a six-issue miniseries, or maybe a series of Weird Detective minis, depending on how the first miniseries does. Now, Fred Van Lente is a great writer, I've enjoyed his past work at Marvel on The Incredible Hercules, and he's been bringing the Conan book back to its glory days at Dark Horse from a writing standpoint. He even put in a reference to Nyar Lothotep in one of his Conan the Avenger storylines, The Damned Horde. So he's clearly a Lovecraft fan. Villanova and Gonzalez did a great job on the artwork, I thought. Villanova laid down some pretty clean lines, and Gonzalez did a great job on the colors. Picos also got to play around with different speech and thought bubbles, fonts, etc. as the letterer for this story. The look of the story turned out great. My recommendation. If there's a series, it's very likely that there's going to be a collection of some sort for Weird Detective in the future, if that series is actually green-lighted. I haven't seen any solicits for it yet, but that doesn't mean that the series isn't coming. The Weird Detective collection will most likely include the 24 pages from Dark Horse Presents discussed here. And I imagine, if it's a six-issue miniseries... Issues 1 through 6 of the series. That's just how Dark Horse usually operates. Now, I have a hard time recommending people buy monthly comics as of late. Um, there really just isn't much out there right now. And it seems like anything worth buying gets collected anyway. I'd say to wait for the collection on Weird Detective 2. But if this story really kind of grabbed you, you might as well do what I'm going to do and pick up the monthly book. Weird Detective looks promising, 
but we only have a small portion of the story. I hope to see more solicits going up for future issues to give me a better idea on where the series is going. I basically bought the three issues of Dark Horse Presents for Mike Grell's Tarzan and the Gods of Opar strip, and I saw Weird Detective as a bonus. But now after reading it, I'm really curious to see where it goes, and I hope the series continues into at least the miniseries. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm at Pulp Crazy on Twitter and facebook.com slash pulpcrazy. My YouTube channel is located at youtube.com slash pulpcrazy. You can email me at pulpcrazy at gmail.com. My author site is located at jasonscottaiken.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.